Welcome to uh, the web panel and uh, thank you for coming. Um, I hope you're having an awesome day. And um, yeah, the, so the idea is I'm super, super happy that we have Doug, Tracy and Sean at, on the stage together. Um, I think it, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting discussion. And um, my idea is for obviously me to speak as little as possible and for them to speak as much as possible. Um, and we thought that it would be most interesting to discuss whatever you are curious about, whatever you think is most interesting. So if you'd like to post a question or upvote a question, um, go to slido.com, enter the V603 code, and uh, yeah, uh, either upvote or post new questions. And we're just going to take them in the order of preference of everybody in the room. Um, and I thought that uh, we could start with uh, just a short introduction uh, by everyone. So, you know, if you could mention, yeah, who you are, uh, where you work, what's your position, uh, or multiple positions, who knows, uh, wha what you find interesting. Hi, I'm Doug. Um, <laughs> I'm originally from Seattle, but I've been a digital nomad for four years, so I kind of live wherever we are. Um, and I've been doing web performance and helping to make the web fast most recently. Nice, web fast. <laughs> My name is Tracy. You can follow me on Twitter at Lady Elite. I'm the CEO of a company called This.Labs. We do JavaScript consulting. Uh, I'm also a Google developer expert for Angular and Microsoft MVP. And then I do community relations for Node. So, okay, quite a handful of roles. Uh, Rob said something about following Tracy, uh, and I'm following Tracy right now. Um, I, I'm, I'm Sean, I'm uh, also known as Swix on the internet. I work on developer experience at Netlify and also help to moderate the r slash react.js subreddit on Reddit. Um, and yeah, that's a short intro. Yeah, fantastic. Like as I said, welcome. Uh, it's awesome uh, that everybody's here. And yeah, like I thought that maybe we would start with a different question, but let's start with the one on top. So micro front ends. Um, is there anybody who is up for answering if that's a hype or reality or if that's something that people should be focusing on? Um, uh, yeah. Well, all three of us don't want to talk about it. I think whatever works for you, no judgment. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, I've, and also I, I've, I've heard people uh, sort of use micro front ends to mean different things. Uh, so. I don't think we even agree on the definition. And if we don't agree on definitions, we're not going to have very constructive conversations mm -hmm. around, around this. Um, so I think the, the, you know, the main people pushing microfinance really hard are the ThoughtWorks people uh, who put it on their radar. And that's, that's something that a lot of people look at. Right. Um, and, uh, that, you know, and there's an interpretation of whether uh, you're talking about shipping different frameworks, shipping your org chart. Um, there's negative spins and positive spins. Um, I've never done it, so I'm just not even going to consider. I mean, I'll say that the idea of micro front ends in whatever definition that one of our clients has of what micro front ends is, which is, you know, one back end and then using like Vue and React and Polymer on different things. I've seen it used in that context. So, mm -hmm. but you know, I mean, every, every buzzword within our industry is basically a reinvention of what's already there anyways, right? So. Would there be a, would there be a situation where you would, uh, because I think like this might be sort of related to the idea that there are silver bullets, uh, like something that works for uh, everything, which is almost never the case. Um, GraphQL solves all your performance problems. Apart from GraphQL, <laughs> obviously, um, <laughs> for now. Um, no, but so do you think there is a situation or a scenario that would, uh, that would warrant using micro front ends? Like, w can you imagine a situation where this is a very good idea or where this is a very bad idea? I mean, again, I think it depends on what definition we are saying is microfinance, but I've, I've seen it work successfully for, uh, you know, different friends in the industry who have been promoting it and talking about it. Um, so, right. yeah, Sean said, whatever works for you. Right. Do the thing. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, whatever works for you. Um, yeah, so the next question would be then, um, yeah, uh, Angular, React, or Vue? Uh, I think that we have sort of maybe whatever seen that one coming. For you. <laughs> <laughs> but then whatever, whatever works for you uh, would be, uh, so what would be your favorite and why that is? And maybe that has changed over the last year too, I can yeah, easily imagine. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, 
I, I, I'll, just, I'll just say a little bit of my personal history. Um, I you know, only learned to, learn to we learned web development two years ago, and I started off with Vue because um, the docs appealed to me, and, they, and um, you know, I, I, I just got further with it than, than I did anywhere with any, anything else. Um, but then I looked at job postings, and, and, and React was clearly dominant in Hacker News job postings and all that. So I think if you're paid enough money, you will overcome any obstacle. To go learn anything, so uh, so when you ask this question, um, the, the the underlying assumption is what are you optimizing for? And at the time, I was optimizing for getting a career and a job in in web development. So um, I think uh, you know React has a lot of hotness. Um, Tracy can attest that Angular makes a lot of money, um, and. Uh, you know, so I, so I, I picked React uh, for the majority of my web development career. Uh, recently, I've been diving into Svelte, um, and my current line is Svelte for sites and React for apps, and that's just ma mainly due to React's weight. Um, yeah. Cool. Tracy? You helping with that Svelte documentation? <laughs> Please do. <laughs> um, so I... Uh, let's see, I started off with Ember, and then I went to Angular, and then I went to React, and then I went to Vue. So I think if you talk about generalizations, people are like, Angular is for enterprise. And um, I really love how easy it is from a convention over configuration standpoint. So it's really easy, the documentation's really easy, it works. Um, I would say if you know JavaScript really well, I feel like a lot of people are more comfortable in React because it is just JavaScript, but not really. <laughs> right, exactly. So I think it's, it's like more ergonomically what you feel comfortable with. A lot of people, just like you, Sean, feel very comfortable in view based on the documentation. I think it's also who is around you, right? Like, I think the community actually matters a lot. So who do you drive within the community and who can actually help you be a better developer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Doug, would you have an opinion on this? I don't have a favorite framework, so. Um, you know, I built my first web page in Notepad, but that sort of dates me, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, it really depends on what works and, you know, what the company you're working for wants it built in, right? Like, at some point, you may love you, but if they're building everything in React, like, right. you know. When it come, because you said at the beginning that you have been making the web a faster, more <laughs> efficient place. Um, yeah, well, like, would you have a favorite uh, in in that direction? That's a great question, and like, no, I don't. I think, Preact. sure, Preact. We'll go with Preact. No, I mean, I think they all have extra weight that can be involved with it, right? You can, and I think any any of the frameworks, you can build it so that it's light and fast and responsive, so that it works. If you're thinking about it, yeah. right? And I think the biggest problem when it comes to JavaScript on the web is it's just like, well, let's just add this and let's add this. And the pages just get bloated with lots and lots of JavaScript or JavaScript that just takes a lot of time to evaluate. And then you're stuck on a page that like, you're trying to scroll and that the phone isn't moving, right? right? So it's just important to, as you're building things and adding features, like what is that going to do to the load time of my page? Or what is that gonna do to the interactivity of the page? Right. Can I also just say something about performance and the different frameworks and technologies? Um, you know, every, every article written out there has some bias somewhere, and the best performance developer in Angular can make something smaller than a React page. Can make, you know, can make. Hmm. So it's like, it also it doesn't depend specifically on the framework you're using of mm. what's smaller, mm. it also depends on how good that developer specifically who's working on yeah. it is at performance. Right, yeah, like obviously that's just one sort of side uh, aspect of uh, what we're discussing, but yeah. Um, I think th this could actually potentially lead us to the next question, uh, which is then what tool approach or library that is currently not well known will everyone be talking about next year? Um, so do you care to predict future? Netlify? Oh, uh, that's well known. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, Svelte. I think, I think more people should explore it. Svelte, okay. Yeah. Does anybody have something? Because, I mean, Netlify is not exactly not well known, I think, by this point. So I think, so I gave a talk earlier today about image performance, and I said, who's heard of web page test? And there were two hands that came up. And, like, if you're building web pages, you should run your website through web page test. It's free, it's open source. 
and it tells you like how bad or how good your web page is. You can run Lighthouse with it as well to test for accessibility and other things. Um, we were just joking about the AirPod Pro website that came out and like run that through web page test. It had like 6,000 requests. Six, you know, there was like 65 megabytes of images. So when you scroll through the page, it's loading a new JPEG every time you scroll, right? So there was like, it was crazy. And they, web page test builds a waterfall of everything loading and you couldn't read the text on it because it was so long, like it was insane. So it's a great tool that gives you ideas on how to look at the performance of your page. And Lighthouse is, it's built into dev tools, so you can use it there as well. And it will tell you where you're screwing up on accessibility, which is also an important thing to think about as well. So from a performance perspective, look at those two to, at the very least to start. Mm -hmm. Cool. Rob really likes, Rob. Uh, and I gave a talk on Pam Stack, and he was talking, he loves state machines, and I love state machines too, not as much as him though. Um, but state machines is like the next big thing. Um, I think it's been really popular this year, so if you haven't used it before, it basically allows you to, uh, you know, turn like tech problems into more business logic problems, and you can kind of like map out the logic of your website through something like XState, for example. So I would say check out State Machines for next year. Mm -hmm. yeah. like State I like State Machines, yeah. Um, well, uh, David Korshi always says yeah. that uh, you're, you're either explicitly writing a state machine or you're implicitly writing one. Um, you don't have a choice. You're, you're writing a state machine anyway. You might as well have tooling around it to, to make it explicit. Right. Um, the, one of the, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure about next year, but I think there's, uh, I pay a lot of attention to megatrends. Uh, there are two that I think are fairly obvious. Uh, so, okay, one's very obvious, one's not so obvious. The obvious one is uh, moving work to ahead of time. Um, and, that, and that means um, we open the Pandora's box of build steps. Now every single framework is bought into build steps and now we're pushing as much work as possible to, um, to, to being done ahead of time for optimization. Um, you know, um, Angular, Vue, Ember are all compiling away uh, features of, of their framework um, so to, to achieve uh, smaller size, right? right. Like that's, that's what IV is, is mainly about. Um, React does not do that uh, to the chagrin of some people, but uh, they're, they're looking at compiling away uh, data requirements, like optimizing data, and that's what, that's what uh, the Relay approach and CSS and JS approaches uh, that Facebook does uh, is about. Um, so ahead of time work is ongoing. Uh, Svelte is built from the ground up for that. That's, why, that's how I view it. Um, Tom Dale actually called this out uh, three years ago in his blog post. He said compilers are the new framework frameworks, and we're seeing that play out um, mm -hmm. in every framework, and that's very cool. Second trend that is not so obvious because it hasn't started yet is um, all, the JS, all the JS tooling that we have, like Webpack and Babel and all that, and TypeScript, uh, all written in JS. Um, I think that um, the, there, is, like, there is an argument for JS people writing, writing tools in JS, mm -hmm. but at points where speed is key, um, you may want to resort to other languages. So um, like npm so, switching to Rust. Uh, so uh, there is there is a there is a Rust port of Babel, um, mm -hmm. and it is 16 times faster. Um, and the, the 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 plain fact is that there's just not that many people who contribute anyway. And if you are contributing, you're in a different tier of JS anyway than 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 regular dev. Um, so the argument is like maybe that argument for sticking to JS. Uh, doesn't hold, especially if you can interrupt uh, with a WebAssembly layer, uh, WebAssembly core. Um, so I th I'm looking at like you know, uh, is 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 more and more of our tooling going to have uh, faster cores, just optimized for for speed? Mm, cool. Um, I, I mean, that definitely leads to the next question, uh, which is, what is the most reliable tool in your tool chain? Um, I think we can, yeah, we well, can I, then I can travel the microphone from. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so TypeScript. Um, Hey, well, you got to say something else now. <laughs> uh, TypeScript, one of the interesting things is they started shipping nightlies, um, and they are encouraging external people to use nightly, nightly builds. Uh, in fact, there's a VS Code extension that you can download that automatically updates your nightly for you, uh, which means that the, the alpha releases are super stable because everything's been, uh, you know, the TypeScript team uses type, TypeScript to write TypeScript and all the external contributors have sorted all the bugs before the alpha, and then between alpha and release, um, you know, even more people sort it out, and by the time it's released, it's super stable, so. Um, yeah. Super cool tip, nice. Yeah. 
Tracy? Yeah, I mean, TypeScript, because I would say um, even in the rewrite of RxJS to TypeScript, uh, you know, there weren't any bugs you could see in JavaScript, but TypeScript revealed a lot of different bugs. So even if you feel like your JavaScript code is amazing right now, by converting to TypeScript, uh, things are, you'll probably unearth a lot of things that JavaScript didn't tell you. So I'm gonna go to the performance side of things and like I live in dev tools, like dev tools are the thing. And like one thing I really like to do is like when I'm pitching like how to speed up a web page is I'll use, you can actually modify the HTML using the, the local overrides and I can optimize all the images and just give them lighter versions of the images and say, here's how fast your page loads you know, from your server and here's how fast it loads when I use optimized images. And I can usually shave off like two, three seconds from their load time. And it's kind of like when you can, and with the dev tools, you can record that as a video. So you can be like, here's before, here's what it'll look like after, right? And then when you can provide sort of visual um, results like that, it helps. Because a lot of times, like as developers, we all know that it'll be faster. But if you can send it up the food chain and say, here's the before, here's the after, here's a video, look how much faster we can make this, it's sort of, it makes it an easy sell to the management. Right. Cool. So TypeScript and DevTools. Yeah. Um, the next question would be then compatibility. Uh, I would imagine that part of that would live in DevTools as well. <laughs> um, what, yeah, what do you think, uh, sort of, are we, I feel like we're definitely closer to the utopia. Uh, I'm not sure if we're reaching it ever. So yeah, what would you, what would you say to that? Uh, there's a lot of controversy going on on Twitter right now with uh, Alex Russell, and he's got some very strong feelings about that uh, with a certain browser that's different than Chromium um, and some of the things that it doesn't support versus what is supported in Chromium. Um, I mean, there's a lot of... So this is sort of a double-edged sword, right? So everybody wants all the browsers to be exactly like the, the same, um, but we all remember when it was all IE and we were just stuck with whatever, you know, we could get from Microsoft, right? So if everyone is do it, if everyone was on a Chromium browser, people would start saying, but are we now stuck with just what Google wants? Mm. Um, so I don't think we're ever going to reach a browser utopia. I think it's gotten better, but mm. I think there will always be things that are missing in one browser versus the other browsers. Right. Does anybody have anything to add on that? I mean, I'll say that, you know, uh, if you look at Brendan Eich and his Brave browser, uh, even though it uses Chromium under the hood, one of the things that he's trying to do with Brave browser is say, if I can own a small percentage of the market and make a difference when it comes to, you know, this whole like model of, you know, ad sharing, it's, you know, his, mm -hmm. his new idea of what, you know, what Brave should be as a browser, or what a browser should be, um, then, you know, he's been successful with his browser. So uh, there will always be those sort of smaller players in the market that are continuously trying to change the standards to make a better web. Mm -hmm. And I think those types of voices are really important. Um, so I don't think we'll re reach Browser YouTube, but is, what, what's Edge using for the mobile? I remember they're using Chromium under the hood, but they're using like another I something under know. the hood for, for okay. mobile. Uh, yeah, iOS Safari, not going away. So. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, what? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, well, yeah, there is a new question that just popped up. Uh, so local versus global Why state handling. Why is this so popular? <laughs> 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 uh, so anything, so my, my personal rule, and I, I'm curious what you all, you all think, um, any, anything that you need to log or uh, save for like offline storage or like resuming your session, um, anything like that, you do global state and then anything that is temporary, like sort of temporary UI state, like uh, you know your your tab state, and you're probably not going to save that. Um, then you just leave that local. Mm. Um, the uh, React's standard approach is to originate everything in local state and then lift it up, lift it up, lift it up as you as you feel out what your app looks like. Um, I think enough people have been burned by that that. Uh, I think people want to start with a, a solid grounding of something like a Redux or MobX um, uh, 
to, to coordinate global state first and then um, add uh, fi you know, small little local state touches. So I, I'd say that's, that's actually a big rift in the React community right now because the React core team is like components uh, own everything and there's a strong part of the React community that wants uh, state to live outside of React. Right. Any opinions? On, yeah. I don't have any opinions either. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Uh, but then we can move on uh, to. Uh, yeah. And that this was actually, uh, I'm going to uh, blame it on the person who came up with this question, which is Sean. Uh, I think so, at least. I think that you suggested this as one of the like interesting questions to discuss. Uh, yeah. Do you have a favorite open source project or something that you think everybody, maybe all of us, should be contributing to? Oh, geez. Um, I can't, let me, I don't have one off the top of my head. So <laughs> I'll go first, like, go right ahead. Uh, I would say that I don't have a favorite open source project, but I think um, constantly when I talk to new developers or people who want to get involved in open source, Literally every single person you talk to who is an open source contributor says, start with the documentation. And I feel like that always falls on deaf ears and people always think, oh yeah, but it's just documentation, who cares? I wanna do something better, cooler, whatever. But you know, if every single open source contributor who has any level of you know, clout in the industry says, I started with documentation. Maybe it's something you should start with too and actually do it so we mm. could have a better open source world. That's a super good point to like every open source project. Um, so I didn't, I didn't actually expect to answer with this, but while, <laughs> while they were talking, I came up with this. Uh, so I think one thing that's very interesting in since there's diff many different sorts of open source projects. A lot of them are corporate funded. A lot of them are solo, like, you know, one maintainer uh, doing, uh, offering his free time or his or her free time to other people. Um, I think one of the interesting ones, uh, the in, there's an interesting class of open source projects that enables other developers. Um, and the one I'm thinking about is Free Code Camp. Um, their whole learning platform is open source and it's a real thing used by millions of people. And, it, and it, once you work on it, you're working in something in production at scale um, and it actually enables the next generation to also come on and do what you did. Um, so I, I really like that idea of like the virtuous cycle of, of uh, paying it forward and uh, they could use help. <laughs> nice. And, and I think if you have an open source framework that you like, they're, like, like Tracy said, they're always looking for documentation. There's always small bugs that just need to be fixed. And um, you see a lot of stuff on, like, on social media where people are like, get really horrible responses to bugs like why isn't this fixed yet blah 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 and the guy's like uh, or the, the the person who's running is like i do this on weekends right because i love it and you know don't treat projects get abandoned because of you know poor burn yeah because well burnout definitely be, but when there are angry people coming at you for something that you were doing cuz you enjoyed doing it Right. It rapidly becomes something that isn't much fun anymore, and that project is going to go away, right? Burnout's going to happen. So by helping and being, I think, having empathy for people, I think is, I know there been talks about that here, but like, help out. Like, if there's something that's bugging you, work towards, talk with the people who are running it and see what you can do to create a pull request to start fixing things. Yeah, I think that's a super good point. And I think it was actually like shown one of your uh, blog posts that was sort of pointing to an article about the comparison between uh, cities or like communal systems and open source community. And I think like in general, like the, the approach that we have to open source is going to have to develop quite a lot. And empathy is definitely playing like a massive role there. Um, yeah, cool. I like the documentation. Yeah. So I have a question. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> is that allowed? Upvote <laughs> it. Um, okay, how do I become a performance expert? How do you become a performance yeah. expert? Oh, geez. Um, so there's a lot of stuff written about how to become. I mean, so basically, I got started because I was working at um, this small telecom in America called AT and T, and. Um, they were really worried about like what was going across the network and they were terrified about like what kind of content and how much data it was. So I was like, well, we've got to learn how to do this stuff. And so I started just reading all of the blog posts and things that were out there and reading the books that were out there and just finding out 
I was doing native apps, but the web is kind of exactly the same thing. It's all HTTP. I mean, it's just, if you send a giant image in a native app or on the web, it's still slow. Um, and so how did I become an expert? I just studied and I started reaching out to people and really just trying to understand what the problems were and, and where the biggest problem pain points were. And so like leading to the next question, what is the worst and best thing about web development is when you study performance, you see, keep seeing websites make wins and then like, you go back six months later and it sucks again because they stopped thinking about it and they just added all the frameworks back in or um, they decided to put like a 75 megabyte video as a background right. on their web page and then all of a sudden you're like, why, why is this slow again? Um, I think there's a lot of, you know, two, one step forward, two steps backwards in web development, especially when it comes to performance. Like I just feel, I, I know a lot of people actually feel burnout working on performance because it's never a priority until it is a priority, and usually by then, it's so in, everything is so baked that it's really hard to start peeling right. that back to make it fast. Right, another problem probably being that it's, as you said, a never-ending work. Yeah, it's never-ending, for sure. Right. Uh, Tracy, Java's, yeah, would you, would you care? JavaScript fatigue. Yeah. Um, best thing and worst thing about Del what, JavaScript fatigue. Uh, but, you know, I think, um, so when I first started doing development, uh, you know, I remember taking a C++ class back in 2002 and being like, this sucks. Like, why am I doing this? And I didn't get excited about development until I did web development because the immediate feedback hmm. for, you know, writing something and then seeing it automatically load on a, on a, on a page got me really excited. Um, but, you know, that's also why I'm not, even though I tried so hard to like love node development and you know .NET development, it's not as satisfying to me because I can't see my immediate result, right? So, right. best and worst thing. Uh, that's that's a pretty good answer. I, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, what like I care a lot about the openness of the web uh, and the fact that it's permissionless. It's not just about censor censorship or like a developer experience of not having to go through random app store reviews, um, but it's it's also about just like uh, keeping an open society, like you need your communications tools to also be open or you're like, that's it, that you're, <laughs> you're right. done in terms of, in terms of that. Um, and I think you see a lot of that in like the more closed societies in, uh, for example, in China. Um, so I think that's what I have to say about that. Uh, right. Did the question change? I, uh, well, yeah, I sort of marked it as answered ah. uh, because I felt that we have gone around, but like if you would like to add more to what is the best uh, no, no, that, 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 was, that yeah. was about the best. And then I think uh, the worst thing is that we keep reinventing wheels. Um, I, think, I think that's, that's good and bad. Um, the, 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 uh, the opportunity to reinvent things um, means that we keep getting better abstract abstractions, um, but there's so much energy wasted on, mm. on these things. Uh, and I, I mean, I don't have a better idea of, of how to do it. It's, so it seems yeah. necessary, <laughs> but uh, I wish we didn't, ha we didn't have to do it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's exactly what Marianne talked about in her keynote this morning. Like that was the idea uh, that we like that it's cyclical. We keep coming back, which actually, um, OK, was the question that was at the top <laughs> before. Pick um, Just pick one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which would be um, the SPAs and sort of going back to SS uh, yeah, server side rendered stuff, uh, because that has definitely been a hype for some time. And I think now with sort of the work done beforehand in order to optimize and people rendering more and more stuff on server side and like maybe going to much sort of more basic setup uh, is definitely something that is happening. So yeah. We'll so so my, uh, I think, okay, this is a little bit of, of like what I do for work. So um, I <laughs> think uh, I think there's an implicit assumption here that SPA is more complex than SSR and that is actually not true for people who are primarily front end. Right, um, and and the complexity is hidden away in managing your servers, um, and a lot of what Netlify is based on. I absolutely don't mean to this be an ad. Like you can host static hosting anywhere else. Um, is trying to solve this trade-off between SPA and SSR mm -hmm. by moving the word, moving the work ahead of time, pre-rendering everything, and then um, using frameworks to hydrate uh, SPA uh, SPA. Um, apps um, and, and then just communicating with APIs. Uh, and that, that seems to solve trade-offs of both performance and complexity. Right. Um, so I, I don't like the free framing of this question. Is like, is it, nece is it necessarily true that SSR is that much more simple? Mm -hmm. um, I think it was. I think it was simple if, if you have uh, frameworks that 
um, you know, control the, the, the whole LAMP stack thing. Like uh, Rails is the most productive framework in the history of humankind, um, right? Tens of billions of dollars created based on Rails, um, but they don't have, they don't offer the modern um, sort of app-like experiences that we come, we've come to expect uh, using JavaScript frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, how do you offer that? Um, you know, it actually may be more towards SPAs. Like Ryan Florence, the creator of React Router, is now, it, it recently like blew everyone's minds by saying that actually we may not need cli um, client-side routing. We may, sh we may actually, for a lot of the times, just uh, want to use a lot of SPA and, and uh, code splitting. Um, so I don't think it's a solved question. I don't know, I'm curious in your perspective. Yeah, I'm curious as well. Um, so, I don't know from a performance perspective, like, I mean, you know, Angular, for example, tries to, you know, they have a project that tries to help with the server side rendering thing. And I was surprised on one of my first trips to India for them to all to say like, no, we cannot use any modern routers out there. We have to do server side rendering because the, per, you know, from a performance perspective, you literally can't support it, right? You mm -hmm. can't do it in those countries. Um, so, uh, I'll just give an anecdotal story. So I used to host an Ember meetup and my co-organizer who started the Ember meetup, he came to give a talk about Ember and his talk was, screw Ember, I don't use Ember, I use Rails, it's easier, why do we have to deal with this crap? And I was like, dude, you are my co-organizer at an Ember meetup talking about why you don't use Ember anymore. So that's my story. <laughs> I don't have anything to add, I'm good. I can't, cool. I can't eat that. <laughs> Um, yeah, then um, we could do the, um, uh, the top question, actually. What is the most interesting talk you have seen recently, and why would that be? I've, I've been thinking about this because it was my question. Uh, <laughs> um, I think a lot of times we are stuck in a bubble of the same kinds of talks of again and again. I think it's interesting to explore neighboring worlds. Um, and one of the best games in recent times is Spider-Man PS4. Has anyone played the Spider-Man PS4? No gamers? <laughs> Three, four? Nice, I see you. Um, <laughs> it is, it is, like, you buy a PS4 and go play it. Um, but uh, the game devs, like we're, we're stuck moving boxes around on screens and we complain about that. Uh, and game devs are modeling like photorealistic 3D experiences um, given very hard, uh, very tight, um, like both software delivery project constraints as well as hardware constraints, like to the, to the fact that, to the, to the matter of like they have to care about uh, the data transfer rates between individual pieces of hardware and optimize for that. Um, so uh, I recommend the PS4 retrospective at uh, GDC, the game dev conference, um, where they talk about um, how they optimize both on the hardware perspective as well as rendering and, and, and how that feeds into uh, the gameplay, um, including uh, the AI elements that are, that are, that are very uh, evident there um, to give you an immersive world. Um, I think these are like meta problems and, th and they even go down to like frame by frame like what, uh, what gets rendered when and how much budget they have and discussing how uh, th like that is uber performance, right? That's not mm. just, that's not just like, you know, uh, IO performance, that's also CPU performance. Um, so, right. so that is fascinating because all those, all these things are the same problems we have in web. It's just that they have, they, they, they have a completely different set of tools and a completely different set of constraints than us. Um, for example, they can, you know, afford to download a gigabyte of games, game assets before. Right. Um, but they have a totally different uh, set of uh, constraints, but uh, the same problems. And it's interesting how to, to see how they solve that. All right, nice. I can't Doug? One. I'm, I'm, no? still th I'm still thinking through my most interesting. <laughs> Tracy, yeah. Um, Would you have anything? I have been really bored lately, but Rob, who works with me, knows that I've been bored for like a year now. Um, so I'm constantly trying to figure out like what is the new exciting thing? What is the whatever? Actually, I remember now. I watched a talk on Vero, which is AR. Does anybody know Vero? It's a framework for AR. Okay. 
that thing is amazing. Like, he was like, okay, let me render a box. I was like, okay, I see a box. And then all of a sudden he said, let me make it a moon. I was like, okay, cool, a moon. And then let me make a dinosaur. And I was like, oh my God, it's a dinosaur. And then, you know, you could actually touch it and then it would move. And I was like, oh my God, and you can create portals. And I swear, every time he showed the code, it's literally as easy as using something like material design. So I've been really obsessed with trying to use Zvero for AR stuff because it just, it was like every single moment I was like on the, my husband was attending this conference and I said, get out of whatever talk you're doing. This is our side project. You need to come attend this talk. <laughs> All right, so games and AR. That sounds cool. Um, you know, honestly, the most interesting talk I saw recently is I was at a, a web conference in, in Zagreb and it was actually, um, kind of like hacking talks and he actually hacked his uh, set top box and I don't want to get him in too much trouble but like he was able to turn on his HBO and he walked through all the steps on how he did it and I thought that was just fascinating <laughs> like um, because apparently all of the data that was going in and out of those set top boxes is just HTTP so like if you can figure out how to intercept it like you've got all sorts of fun things that you can do and to me that was just mine well number one that it was all http i'm like whoa um but then like that he was able to like and if i turn this bit what will happen and then all he shows his tv and it's like oh yeah that's right. kind of cool <laughs> right um i would like to do uh two more questions but we don't have that much time left so we'll have to keep the answer short uh and maybe the second question would actually be interesting like what uh, a sort of new grad web developer uh, what would you recommend that people should be like mostly focusing on maybe stuff that you don't learn at university but you do need to know them for doing the work that you're doing or that we are all doing? You know, not to harp on what I always harp on, but like um, I think there's a lot of, and I get this a lot when I talk about performance and people are like, well, 5G is coming and we'll all be safe then because we can put whatever the heck we want on the web because everyone's gonna have gigabit connections. But if you think about it, like the most recent phones don't support 5G, um, like the latest Apple phone isn't 5G supported yet, right? And I've been doing mobile long enough that I heard people say 3G, that's gonna solve everything. <laughs> right. And then about five years later, we heard the same, you know. About four, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, we still have to think about what we're sending over the, over the network and, um, it, like we said, it really doesn't matter about framework, which framework you use, just think about how you're doing it in a smart way. Um, because there are people on around the world, and not just, there's always sort of this idea, like people on slow connections are in areas where there's just isn't a lot of capital or mm. people buying things. But I've been on really, really slow connections all over Europe over the last three or four years. And in America, um, you know, the house I have in Seattle, um, I can't use cellular in my house because it just doesn't work. I'm just too far away, right? right. We need to, th and you know, these are areas where there are people who are consuming and trying to use your, the things you're building. And if it's too slow, you've got to make sure that you're testing on slower networks and on maybe not the latest iPhone or Android phone that you just bought. Like get some of these really cheap ones that are like 30 or 40 euros right. and see what it looks like. Right. You say, you know, say? Your your comments just now, like that entire statement, made you sound like a more politically correct Alex Russell. I was <laughs> to stay politically correct about it. Yes. You're very good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would say, you know, I think uh, web development. One of the reasons why I got into web development was because it excited me, right? And I want to work on exciting things that I can get excited about. So I would say new developers should just do that. Like, if it's not exciting, don't do it. If it's exciting, do more of it. Okay, cool. Um, I can deal with, like, kind of the, f the first top two questions uh, together. <laughs> um, Perfect. And uh, well, so first of all, what do you think a new web grad web developer should focus on? Whatever gets you paid. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, okay. you know, and it, I think it's an intersect. This is like the hedgehog theory of, um, you should work on whatever you're interested in, good at, and can get paid for. That intersection is your sort of sweet spot in, in, in terms of whatever. And, and so I really don't care if it's front end or back end. Whatever gets you paid, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> everything is everything's growing. Everything's, uh, there's cool stuff going on everywhere. I'm like, 
I have nothing to do with machine learning, but I keep track of what's going on in machine learning because I think that's going to shape uh, the majority of uh, my lifetime. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, absolutely, go focus on that if, if you're if you're keen on that. Why is web development maybe 10% front end? Um, I think that's true. That's true for uh, whoever asked this question. Um, I think that there is a sort of as more and more companies provide uh, managed services, <laughs> then you don't have to code them you can just pay for them, which means that your work moves towards the, the front end, right, uh, to differentiate yourself in terms of products. So, which is why I always like to say that, um, I think there's a shift going on. Like, we used to identify splits between front end and back end. Um, I think now it's actually more about product versus platform, um, and a lot of people don't need proprietary platforms. They can just use other people's platforms, which means you're 100% product, and 100% product, you're mostly front end, you're stitching together some serverless stuff, um, or using some proprietary uh, platform as a service, that's it. So what are you doing uh, learning all the back end stuff if you can just pay for it and you get closer to your customer because the money is always closer to your customer anyway. Right. Um, that's my perspective, I'm, I'm curious yeah. uh, other people are. Yeah, sadly, we're out of time. Sorry. Like I would love to continue with this, uh, but I'm going to thank massively uh, Doug, Tracy, and Sean for uh, being here, uh, for yeah, providing answers to some very tricky questions, wicked problems. Uh, thank you all much. Of, of, yeah, thank you for joining. I'm sure that they are around. Uh, so throw more questions at them individually or collectively. Who knows? Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.